it if I can butt in, Father. Mm-hmm. It's hard. It's hard to read about Solomon, the thousand wives or concubines or whatever yeah. it was. That's a difficult thing to read about with the prism, like you're saying, of Christianity these days. And I don't know, maybe you can answer. Like, that's allowed. Why is God okay with it? I mean, he's called the wisest man to have roamed the earth and allowed to build the temple and thousand, thousand concubines. Like, it seems to me super outside, you know, the norm of the God that we're used to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's, there's a really important distinction that we have to make, especially when we are reflecting back on the things that we hear described very clearly in the Old Testament. I want people to get used to the idea of recognizing that not everything that is described in great detail in Scripture necessarily translates into God has prescribed. What do I mean by that? It is not because the Bible is completely transparent and in the Old Testament it records all things the good, the bad, and the ugly, then that necessarily translates into God therefore allows and blesses the good, the bad, and the ugly. So when you see so much sexual corruption, so much fornication, so much adultery in the Old Testament, that doesn't mean that God is blessing it. Because very clearly, the same God who says, I am the beginning and the last, the Alpha, the Omega, and that there is, there, the God has never changed. Scripture makes this very clear. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. When the Lord comes in the New Testament, and Jesus Christ is preaching to the people in the Gospel of St. Matthew in chapters 5, 6, and 7. He then goes ahead and says very clearly that if a man even looks at a woman and lusts for her in his heart, he has now committed adultery. So it's very clear that God hasn't changed his standard. But what God is doing is that he's dealing with the people at the stage that they were at when it comes to their spiritual maturity. So that he allow Solomon to go ahead and have all of those concubines? Indeed, he did. Some people might ask, why not strike him down? Well, I think for the same reason that God doesn't strike me down, thank God, every Mm -hmm. single time that I commit a sin. It is not because God doesn't strike me down that that means his tolerance of my freely expressed will translates into that's what he wants me to do. So I just want us to be careful in that narrative because, again, it's described, but it's definitely not prescribed. So it's a concession, in other words. It is. Mm-hmm. And, and you can see the difference, again, the contrast between pre-fall humanity and post-fall humanity, right? So when you look at Adam and Eve and how they're meant to be united as one, there was, n- there was no third party there, right? But afterwards, mm-hmm. after the fall, it became a different story. And that's the whole point of uh, the Sermon on the Mount, right? So you were told a tooth for a tooth, but now I tell you, Right, to give the other cheek, right? So it's this progress that God is leading humanity from the temporary Old Testament law to the New Testament law, which was always the desire of his heart. So it's not as if God is changing his mind or God is different. God is the same always and forever, right? But the way he deals with humanity is different, and that's based on on the stage humanity is in because they are the ones who are changing. They are the ones who are progressing. Mm 